Hello gang, and welcome to FRSC 1132 Fire Service Instructor. My name is Adam Roberts, and I will be your instructor for this class. And even though this is not a live lecture, you can email me anytime at aroberts at athenstech.edu, or you can give me a call in the office at 706-357-0162. Or you can look in on the calendar and look for my virtual office hours where we can meet and discuss things in Blackboard Collaborate. So, what do you say we go ahead and get started? Objective number one. Explain the characteristics required of an effective fire and emergency service instructor. So instructors must have certain characteristics in order to teach. And these characteristics, though aren't required, they really speak to the heart of being able to do a good job teaching. So let's kind of look at them. We're going to talk about desire to teach, motivation, subject and teaching competencies, leadership ability, and strong interpersonal skills. So the one at the top here, desire to teach, to me is the most important. You must be present. No amount of knowledge and experience can create an effective instructor. And basically, you have got to want to be there. And if you want to be there, it's going to trigger your motivation where it's not one of these voluntoles, so you're going to be all just kind of humdrum and going through it. You actually want to be there, and you want to get the information across to your students. So that generates enthusiasm and when you're enthusiastic then your students are going to become enthusiastic. So this is a contagious thing. And then if you generate that enthusiasm in the students then hopefully your administrators will also begin to buy in. So whatever thing you're teaching, maybe it's a new concept, if your students are enthused and engaged by this new concept, it could even help foster change within the department. Some new piece of equipment perhaps or some sort of um, new SOP or things of that nature. So the student enthusiasm is fostered in main time by various methods such as lively and very local delivery meaning, hey, maybe you teach the class at different places or, you know, actual on scene, you get out of the classroom. Uh, you change it up a bit. Uh, you have high energy levels, meaning, again, you're, you're happy to be there. Maybe you move around the class a little bit. You don't stay locked behind the podium. And obvious love of teaching the subject material, if you have that, it's going to show. So this can increase the willingness to the learner to basically learn it and be there. So that's desire to teach. Now with motivation, we're not exactly talking about motivating yourself because that kind of goes into desire to teach. When we're talking about motivation, we're talking about motivating the students. So you can clearly communicate what actions must be performed and, and why it must be formed to the student. Show the students the importance of the presented information. You know, why does this matter to them? And once you do that, it's going to create buy-in and it's going to encourage the student uh, as they attempt to learn the skill or the new topic. And then once they begin to learn it, reward successful attempts, whether it be verbal praise or, or whatever the case may be. Or, you know, if it's a skill, give them a, that pat on the back. Hey, you're doing a good job. Use them as an example. And then, of course, when they're doing something wrong, if it's an, an actual skill, don't criticize them, but correct them. Hey, I understand you did this because of this, but actually this is better and why. Or, hey, that looked good, however, it's not quite right, let's do it this way and you'll be spot on. So, again, motivate the student, but do it in such a way as to inspire them, not to critique them or make them feel uh, belittled or something of that nature. Next is subject and teaching competencies. 
And when we're talking about that is, do you know the material and are you competent to disseminate the material? And not just know the material, but be open-minded and know that, you know, there are alternative methods and ideas out there on that probably subject you're teaching. And be open to them and know that there's more than one way. And I've always felt that if we at least acknowledge that one way, and teach it that way, but acknowledge that there's more than one way, um, it kind of helps broaden the horizon saying, okay, I know that there's more than one way to do this, and you may see them, but for the sake of competencies in this class, I want you to learn it this way, you know, X, Y, Z. Of course, uh, also when you're looking at uh, subject and teaching, you know, make sure it's something that you're comfortable with, that you know what you're talking about, because students will definitely call you out on something if you don't really know what you're talking about, especially in this day and age of the old Google machine. So know what you're talking about. <clears throat> Next we have leadership ability, and this really goes a long way. So. You need to be able to lead or guide the students through the requirements, knowledge, and skills of the class, and ensuring that their needs are met. You need to provide appropriate learning opportunities, you know, give examples, ideas, encourage the students to discuss things and to think about it and have them uh, formulate and come to an appropriate conclusion on said material. As a leader, you should always, of course, be a follower first. So set the example, you know, follow rules and regulations. You know, if you require students to wear a certain uniform and look presentable, well, then you should wear the appropriate uniform uh, and, of course, look presentable. And you should always apply things fairly across the board. You shouldn't give exceptions to one student over another. And I've always operated, you know, under the premise that consistency is best. You know, if you allow one student to make up an assignment, hey, you got to offer that chance to everybody. Uh, it may create more work for you, but uh, again, it's the right or fair thing to do. Or, you know, you don't allow anybody to make up the assignment and you say, hey, you know what, I hate it for you. It was there, it should have been there. You know, you get what you get. Now, when you're looking at leadership styles, there are different types, obviously, uh, and this is a whole nother lecture, you know. Are you going to be more autocratic, or authoritarian, or, or democratic type? And I do believe that there's a time and a place for everything, but at the end of the day, you are the instructor, and of course, you're going to be the boss. So, dictate you know, the situation will dictate what leadership style you need to be in. But do understand the fact it's hard to go back from, okay, uh, really laissez-faire and just whatever to the authoritarian or dictator mode. Now, you can always start rough and ease up later, but if you start easy and then try to um, stiffen up, they're going to buck the system, and it's going to create some controversy within uh, your class. So finally, let's look at strong interpersonal skills. And in my opinion, this really goes beyond these little terms here, but we'll go ahead. Um, you need to be have clarity, which is the ability to precisely and clearly explain concepts and processes through a systematic presentation of material. You need to have sensitivity, which is the ability to view the learning environment from a student's perspective, recognizing the barriers to learning and communication. And of course, we already talked about fairness. And the fairness must be applied when dealing with other instructors, staff members, and supervisors, and public. And with the interpersonal skill, I really want to focus on something not really so much in the text, but uh, the ability to communicate and get along. So not just with the students, but with the administration and other instructors and staff, because if you have that ability to get along with everybody, it's going to go a long way in completing whatever task that you want to get done.
All right, some more characteristics. Preparation and organization. My goodness, there is so much time that is put in for a class that your students really don't know about. Uh, so when you're looking at preparation, you know, make sure all materials, handouts are ready, printed out, all your AV equipment works, and that your prop works, and everything in the classroom is where it needs to be. Of course, test. You know, do you have the test ready? Is the equipment that's going to be used for the test also ready? And then you need to be able, with you know, preparation and organization, also look at eliminating barriers. So when you're preparing for the class, where is the class being held? Is there any audio or visual issues uh, that may inhibit the learning environment? You know. Arrive at an appropriate time. You know, if you tell the students to be there at 7, well, then you probably should be there at 6.30 or even 6, you know, to make sure things are set up and ready to go and that the door is open. Don't come running in, of course, at the last minute. Practice your presentation. If it's something that you haven't done before, you know, make sure everything flows and you don't hit any stumbling blocks and you have a good idea of time management and how long it's going to take. Ingenuity, creativity, and flexibility. Oh my goodness, uh, this is an absolute must, must for an instructor. You know, be creative, be, be flexible. You know, understand that you have a subject to teach, but there's a million different ways to teach it, as long as at the end the students gets what they need and can learn and do. So you may need some ingenuity. Uh, maybe you teach a subject or topic and you teach it you know actually outside of the classroom and you do it totally hands-on uh, maybe you bring in guest speakers perhaps uh, you know maybe you do it over the web whatever the case may be and then of course flexibility is an absolute must you know you have your daily schedule you say something's supposed to take four hours well hey if the students aren't getting it maybe you need to give them another four hours or let's say they get it in two do you really need to waste time for another two hours and have them bored by practicing a skill they already mastered or move on and then of course you also got to think about the weather and of course we'll go more into you know weather and things of that nature so you have to be flexible because things can and always will come up next empathy and you got to be able to understand that students and instructors and, and whatnot have issues and you need to be able to kind of understand and have empathy for those individuals and understand that they're, they have feelings and, and try to balance that with teaching the material but ensuring that you do your job. So it's a fine line there. Of course, conflict resolution. Trust me, you will have to play mediator, uh, mediator a lot of times in terms of conflict. You know, students in turn uh, may get aggravated at one another or if you're having like a recruit class and you have a couple students that are you know, arguing over how to do a skill you know you got to be able to come in and settle it uh, whether it be you know what grade they got or whatever the case may be so know how to resolve an issue and then of course again fairness uh, I know we've talked about it I'm not going to beat a dead horse but you need to be fair and be consistent and do everything the same for everyone Okay, some characteristics that, or I should say, really personal characteristics that they recommend an instructor has. So per, uh, first is personal integrity, and this is based on values and morals of that individual. It's a, basically a personal code of ethics that provides specific guidelines for actions and decisions. It may be consistently applied to all situations and people. It has the respect of students and maintain when personal ethic code is followed and it can be difficult to gain when integrity is compromised or questioned 
honesty and here are the bullet points for honesty it must uh, you must always be truthful and honest students want and expect honesty be willing to admit that you don't know the answer but of course uh, tell them you'll find it and then lastly on this one we have sincerity and that is a personal quality of being open and truthful and will encourage students to react respond and cooperate more positively and willingly a lack of sincerity can undermine an instructor's educational message and either distract students from learning or put the students on the defensive. So be, be sincere and not you know, condescending when you're trying to teach. Learning objective number two, explain the term profession as it relates to the fire and emergency service instructor. A profession basically is a calling or a vocation that requires special knowledge and long intense preparation. It requires learning scientific, historical, or scholarly principles that apply to specific skills, processes, and methods. A profession maintains a high standard of personal achievement and conduct. And of course, you must also have uh, a commitment to continue to study and educate and advance yourself, as well, of course, your students. Learning objective number three, summarize the instructor's obligation to the student, the organization, the profession, and themselves. So our obligation to the student, you want to ensure the student will perform the duties safely and skillfully in the fire emergency service. Ensure the training meets the needs of the organization, policies, and procedures. Ensure that the training supports the mission of his or her organization through effective training. Keeps with the needs of the organization and its policies and procedures and of course meets all applicable federal, state, and local laws. Our obligation to the profession, it provides an important link between the student and the fire emergency service profession. It provides a positive role model and effective leadership. You must become a role model for safe behavior in the fire emergency services. Now, when we talk about that, you know, if you require the students to wear their helmet with the chin strap underneath the chin and not tuck behind the helmet like many of us do, then you need to be seen wearing your helmet appropriately. Now, your duty to yourself and in terms of a profession, you need to continue professional development. That way you can stay abreast of current changes in the industry. And you must always be aware of these new improvements or development because what you learn today will definitely change tomorrow. And know that when you learned a skill, the odds are it has probably changed. So keep an open mind and stay abreast of current trends. Objective number four. Summarize the challenges frequently faced by the instructor. All right, so managing challenges is an important and rewarding skill for an instructor. First, familiarization with standards and those that may apply to the training that is being provided. So for example, if you're doing live fire training, then a good standard to consult would be NFPA 1403. And this is intended to improve training safety. And these standards are out there. It just depends on what subject 
your teaching. So, for example, obviously anything in the fire service, I would recommend NFPA, OSHA, and any applicable EMS type regulations in case you're teaching that. Next is your instructor priorities, and they may perform multiple tasks within the organization. You may be required to develop training curriculum in addition to delivering courses to the students. And then finally, you have your student priorities here. And with that, be aware of the time constraints and other outside influences that are on the student's ability to complete and do the training. Student diversity must be at the forefront of your brain in this day and age. So you must be prepared to teach students about gender as well as various age, race, sexual preference, and religions and beliefs. So basically, again, you want to treat all individuals in a fair and unbiased fashion. Know that you may have students with learning disabilities and when you're dealing with learning disabilities, you need to be able to make reasonable accommodations that meet the needs of the individual and the organization. And if they do have a disability, we'll, we'll go more into this later on, but make sure that there's some sort of documentation there. All right, changes in the profession. You must take current on the changes at the fire and emergency service profession and incorporate these changes, of course, in your training. Cooperative relationships, an absolute must. And that's with uh, agencies and private sector and other fire departments, uh, regulatory people, you name it. Uh, I've always operated under the premise that, hey, you know, I'll help you out, you help me out, and we'll get done with what we need to get done. And then, of course, always uh, volunteer to do stuff for your accrediting bodies and agencies uh, in case you ever need a favor to be named later. All right, finally we have organizational uh, promotion on this slide and you must be able to promote your organization and its beliefs to your students and other outside organizations. And with that, you need to make sure that you're assisting the student with matching the student's training and achievement with that of the profession, and of course, your organization and their professional advancement. Management directives. You must adhere, obviously, to what your boss wants done. But as an instructor, I'm a firm believer that you should advocate change when something needs to be changed and work with superiors within the organization to show them the reason why they need to change, give them the appropriate information and material, and of course be an advocate for it. You should have knowledge of the instructional environment. So you should have a working knowledge of the environments available to do your training. So not just the classroom, but field uh, places, places to conduct maybe driver's training, live burn training, high rise, uh, whatever the case may be. So know what's out there. That way you can have a safe training environment. So be familiar, of course, with local rules, regulations, and the AHA, and do your absolute best to make sure that we have the safest training environment out there, because there are no need to lose anyone or get anybody hurt during a training evolution. Of course, professional development, we've already talked about continuing education, so we're not going to beat that dead horse. Course scheduling is something um, that also comes into play. And I guess we can even back up and look at the professional development for the students. But when you're scheduling things, you may need to schedule around other events that are in the fire department. Maybe they have pre-plans already scheduled, hydrant maintenance, whatever the case may be. And is this on-duty or off-duty training? Is it required or optional? Is it something that uh, these folks can take to develop their own resume, if you will, so they can be able to test for the next layer of promotions? 
Next, we have fund and resources. And I hate to tell you guys, but a lot of times in training, funding and resources um, don't necessarily meet the demand. So you got to do a lot with a little. So uh, you must be able to seek out training opportunities that are available and keep within your budget. And if you got a big budget, more power to you. That's usually uh, the exception rather than the rule. So a lot of times you have to pair with other agencies to get what you need done done. And of course, maybe swap equipment and things back and forth so you can get the needed stuff to teach the class. Finally, we have qualified instructor recruitment. You don't have to teach everything as, as the instructor. And I implore you not to. It's always good to have somebody else and express their opinions and, and desires, and maybe they have a better way to teach things. Also, let's understand that, hey, you know what? You may be a great instructor, but you can't teach everything in the sense that there are certain topics that you may not be the best instructor at because you really don't like them. So, you know, find qualified instructors and recruit them, and then that way they have that zeal and that passion to teach that subject to the students, and the students get the best quality learning environment. Okay, on to learning objective number five. Explain local, state, provincial, and federal laws applicable to fire and emergency training. So we have three laws to look at here right quick. The first is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, and that basically prohibits the employment practices that discriminate based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It protects employees from sexual, verbal, and physical harassment, and uh, the Canadian equivalent here is a Human Rights Act. Essentially, do what you're supposed to do and, and do it right here, folks. Next, we talked a little bit about this, but it's the ADA, American with Disabilities Act, and it prohibits discrimination against a student with an identified disability. And again, the key here is identify, meaning there's documentation. And it requires the instructor and the training organization to, of course, provide what is known as reasonable accommodations. And what is a reasonable accommodation? And that depends on, of course, the organization and the individual. So let's say that you have a student that wants to come member your fire department, they're going to recruit school, and they have a uh, withered hand or a deformed hand. Now, you don't discriminate against them because of that deformity, but you put them through the paces of being a firefighter and they pass everything. Now, one reasonable accommodation that you would probably have to make for this type of person would be personal protective equipment. Is it reasonable for an organization to have maybe tailor-made gloves or turnout gear for that individual? And, you know, ultimately this is going to kind of come up to a judge, but I would say yes, yes, that is a reasonable accommodation. Now, let's look at another instance, and I thought this was an interesting court case that I read, and this kind of gives you a, a premise on what can be considered a reasonable accommodation. Now, there was an individual that lost his job at a fire department because he worked there he was off duty and ended up, I was going to say, um, was messing around with some fireworks and ended up uh, going blind in one eye. Uh, it exploded in his face, something of that nature. So with the loss of that um, one eye, he eventually had a, a loss in depth perception, which means he couldn't tell how far away things were. And with that loss of depth perception, he could no longer drive. So he was uh, terminated from the department. Now, he did sue, saying that, hey, you know, he had a, a document disability and, and they got rid of him for no reason, and that his argument for a reasonable accommodation was for the department to hire someone to drive him around. Well, that could be an argument, but the department argued back saying, hey, we don't have engines right now with two people on them. We have uh, primarily a volunteer basis where 
we have this one paid person per station that drives the engine to the call and then the volunteers you know show up and the court actually ruled in the favor of the municipality saying you are right um, that is an undue burden on the organization so that is not considered a reasonable accommodation so it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis and me personally I always try to come down on the student uh, as best I can of course within reason the third one we have got to talk about here is the Privacy Act or the Buckley Amendment and that basically states that a student's test and grades are privileged information that should be kept private uh, and should be restricted to basically the uh, student and the instructor unless that student gives permission for that information to be released uh, a good example would be like parent or guardian so if you're teaching maybe in the technical college or, or um, in the private sector and you have a 18 year of age student well you cannot divulge that information to the parent without consent of the student because they're basically considered an adult at this point And there are certain waivers to the Buckley uh, Amendment, but um, they have to be signed by the student. Uh, other things to look at in this case uh, would possibly be medical records. So look on page 22 and read that and see what you guys think. All right, so know your state and provincial municipal department organizational laws. So what is going on in your jurisdiction and make sure you abide by it. So for example, let's say that um, you want to teach a class on wildland firefighting and you go to set a fire out in like a wild urban interface area well at that particular time uh, a year let's say it's summertime and in your current jurisdiction you have an ordinance or a regulation that prohibits outdoor burning now is that something you're going to want to do and me personally no uh, even though there's probably a caveat in there for for training but it makes for sour grapes if you're doing something that other people cannot so know what's going on and what you can and can't do learning objective number six the difference between codes and standards Codes are bodies of law arranged systematically, usually pertaining to one subject area, such as mechanical code, building code, electrical code, or fire code. A standard is a criterion document that are developed to serve as models or examples of a desired performance or behavior and that contain requirements and specifications outlining minimum level of performance provided or constructed. Now standards are not laws unless they've been adopted by the authority having jurisdiction. They are recognized and developed by experts in whatever field it is, whether it be fire and emergency service. NFPA is an excellent example of a standard that was developed or is developed by institutions within the profession. And even though NFPA 1403 is not currently a law in Georgia, it is something that will be used to measure your actions if someone gets hurt or killed during your training evolution. So someone gets hurt or killed during a training evolution class that you or holding that has to do with live fire and I don't care whether it's just smoke or hate straw or whatever the case may be if you do not follow the specifications of 1403 
then you know you're looking at criminal or possible civil liability so basically in georgia everything is all hunky-dory until someone gets hurt and when someone gets hurt then they're going to start referencing standards saying that okay this is good practice as done by you know members in your profession and they're going to kind of hold you to that and of course if you didn't do it well look out um, you can quite possibly be in some serious trouble Learning objective number seven, discuss ethical conduct as it relates to the fire and emergency service instructor. So ethical conduct, it must be followed to be considered a, a professional. The code of ethics is a statement of what is right and proper conduct for an individual in all relationships and activities within an organization. In education, ethical situations include many situations such as sharing exam papers between successive classes, allowing plagiarism of material produced by others, allowing cheating on the exam, advancing students who have not received proper training or passed the course, avoiding making bad judgment, be aware of common explanations used to justify your wrong actions. So pretend the action is legal or ethical, believe the action is really in the best interest of the organization or individual, believe the action is okay because no one will ever discover it, and explain that the organization will support the action even if it is discovered. So, you know, this is ways that, you know, you can justify in your brain that you're doing the right thing, and, and really it's not. So know your ethical programs, know your organization individual code of conduct. Uh, this could possibly include a written code of ethics or ethic policy that you may have. It can be a brief one or, or two page statement and it just basically can be a set of values that are going to govern your organization such like as honesty, integrity, respect for example. Now, characteristics defines acceptable and unacceptable behavior, promotes high standards of practice, and fosters a strong ethical climate. Now, instructors will have to deal with ethical issues all the time, and they're going to occur regardless of code and ethics you may have, and you must be able to manage when they arise during training. So think about it, know what you're going to do and and do it essentially. So I always like, especially like for example, recruit schools, having a rule book. And that rule book outlines all the behavior I expect from students. And if you violate the rules, then it outlined what's going to happen to you. So for example, if you get caught cheating on the test, that's an automatic dismissal. So you justify, you catch them cheating on the test, guess what, they're gone. Hey, you know what, we went over the rule book, you signed it, you had a copy of it, I hate it for you. Um, time to pack your bags and go. Of course, I will say this, this can be kind of rough. Um, I, in one of my recruit classes, had a student that failed three tests and we operated on a three strikes and you're out policy so you know the first strike was hey you know this is a verbal warning uh, what happened allow you make it up you know what can we do to help you pass uh, of course the second was written and after the third it was done but this was a student that was liked by all instructors and their fellow students and for whatever reason, this person just had a hard time um, grasping the information and, and taking tests. Uh, was it painful to let him go? Uh, absolutely. You know, was I tempted to just sweep it under the rug? Absolutely. Did I? No, I did not, because you know that kind of violated my own you know ethical morality. However, you know, 
you justified it in your brain by saying, well, hey, you know what, It's a, he's a nice guy, he really needs the job, blah, 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 it's not that big a deal. In actuality, it is a big deal. So as an instructor, know that you have to set the example and set a higher set of standards for yourself as opposed to, uh, you know, your students. So let's finish up here. Summary, instructors must understand the obligations that they have to the student, the organization, the profession, and themselves. Instructors must have the knowledge and ability to accept the challenges that teaching affords. And instructors must be aware of all the laws that apply to the training process. And ignorance of a law is not a defense, meaning you are still guilty even if you didn't know that there was a law about that. All right, gang, so if you have any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or again, give me a call in the office at 706-357-0162. All right, so go ahead and make sure to read the chapter if you haven't already. Go ahead and get the review questions knocked out and be thinking about a topic that you want to teach because at the end of this class you're going to be required to present some source of information on, on some subject that you want to teach. About a 15 minute presentation so you should have an uh, introduction, a body, of course a conclusion and all your assignments leading up to it should be based on that at the end of class. So start keeping that in mind because you're going to have to get cracking on it here real soon.